Welcome to episode 124 of the Life Changing Questions podcast. And today we have Mr. Kevin Pates on the call. I, I personally think Kevin is one of the best kept secrets in the industry. He's a, a wealth of knowledge and wisdom, and I can't wait uh, for you to, to hear some of the call today. Just to give you a bit of his background, Kevin is the former president and COO of a multinational financial services company. And he left all of that behind in 2008 to pursue his own business, where he's uh, built a very successful business consulting practice uh, called Black Diamond Financial. And his motto there is we monetize genius. And you can hear uh, in this episode about how, how he does that. Now he's got clients on three continents. He's also the owner of five companies uh, himself. He gets to live and work uh, all around the planet, wherever he chooses to work, he can. He set his business up in that way. And uh, he says his mission is to be able to uh, live and work all around the planet so that one day he may be able to be, may able to be off the planet. So uh, Kevin, welcome to the, uh, the episode today. We're, we're very much looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Kevin. It's always a pleasure to be around you. <laughs> uh, and, and likewise, Kevin, likewise. Now, Kevin and I go back uh, a decent amount of time now, maybe five years, maybe even yeah. six years. And we yeah, even more, I think six or seven years now. Yeah. Maybe more. I, I, I lose track of time because we've known each other for a very long time. We've had the of uh, presenting yeah. in many different countries together. And Kevin, I, there's so much there, even in your bio about your background, I want to dig into. Tell me about this uh, this mission to uh, to one day be off of the planet. You have an aspiration to go to space. I do. Yes, I've had an aspiration to go to space since I was about eight years old, and uh, I've always wanted to be an astronaut. I thought, uh, you know, when I was a little kid, I used to write to NASA and ask them to send me anything and everything that they could send me. And I used to get these brown Manila envelopes with stuff from NASA, you know, everything from patches to space charts to, you know, navigation to all sorts of different things. And I'd plaster it all up in my room. And, uh, you know, I remember saving uh, all of my pennies. I used to have a little uh, paper route that I get a nickel every time I delivered a paper. And uh, I saved it up to buy my Saturn V rocket, which was this beautiful, grandiose, four foot tall Saturn V rocket that took me about a month to put together and it was just gorgeous. So, but I, you know, it was funny because I, I always wanted to go to space, but over the years, uh, my reasons have changed, you know, before it was all about the adventure and it was about, you know, doing that. But now I've realized I just, I got to get off the planet, man. I want to see the entire earth from a different perspective. You know, my dad said it best. My dad was a watchmaker, as you know, and one of the things he said to me one time when, when the, new, um, the new digital watches had just come out, and he said, uh, I said, Dad, are you going to get a digital watch? Because I thought, you know, he's a watchmaker. He's going to have the latest and greatest of everything. He said, son, I don't think so. I said, what? How, you, how, you're a watchmaker. How can you not have the latest and greatest of everything? He says, son, when I look at my watch, I want to see what time it isn't as well as what time it is. And that whole idea of context, you know, to be able to see the planet in context, to be able to see it outside of itself so that you can truly witness it for what it truly is. I think it'll be for me anyways, the most realistic view of, of, what, of what is the earth, but also what, what we represent for the earth you know, and I just feel like I need to get off the planet so I get a chance to see that, experience that, and then bring it back. Every astronaut who's been off the off planet has said it changed their life, and I just think that there's, it's worth it to be able to be able to see the entire planet, no uh, borders, no politically induced anything, just to look at it and appreciate it for what it is and what it, more often then see what it can be as well. So that's kind of a longer answer than you probably wanted. <laughs> Perfect answer. And uh, I, I'm having the vision uh, there already as you're talking about it. It's giving me chills on the back of my neck to think about that. So uh, look, if, if Elon uh, or Jeff Bezos or uh, Sir Richard yeah. happens to listen to this episode today, then look, let's, let's hit up Kevin. Let's, let's make, make arrangements for <laughs> him and find a way to do that. Uh, and if by chance they're not listening and you know those guys, then, then let's have a conversation. And see let's have a do. conversation, guys. Yeah, exactly. Find a way. There's, there's, there's got to be a way. Well, actually, Kevin, it may come around, I guess, um, as we're seeing, you know, space tourism is, is kind of beginning to take off. It was probably yeah. about six months ago, 12 months ago, Sir Richard. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, himself. Yeah. So 
it could it could become a reality. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Just and there's only a 100, 1 in 264 chance of anything fatal happening. So, 1 in 264. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I'll, nah, I'll take those odds. <laughs> <laughs> so, the odds are pretty good. Yes. <laughs> you, just, you just wouldn't want to be doing 264 flights, I don't think. That's right. Sure. I think I'll skip that one. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. oh, that's, that's great. And Kevin, tell us, please tell us a little bit about you know, your background and your history because. When you reach the heights of a president or COO of a, a large organization like you did, now, I, I, if I recall, you didn't just have thousands of people under you. I think you had tens of thousands of people. No, actually, you. it was about 3,500, I think, was a, the, the top, top mark. Yeah, yeah. 30, so 3,500 people working underneath you. I mean, it's a pretty significant uh, role. Not everyone uh, accomplishes that in their career. But right. you, you got to a point where you were doing that, you were leading the organization, and then you choose to leave it all, be, all behind to start your own business. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what it was like, where you're working, and why you made that transition. Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I always enjoyed work. You know, nobody grows up as a kid saying, you know, someday I want to be a banker, you know, <laughs> or I want to be in finance, right? They just yeah. don't. It's generally something that you fall into. And it always reminded me of the song, um, you know, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with, right? Yeah. And I, I felt that about banking because I kind of fell into it by, by, by necessity, right? It was a job being unoffered. It was management training. And I thought, well, they're going to train me to be a manager and pay me. Okay, not much, but they were going to pay me. So I said, okay, let me take that. But what was interesting about it is as I got into it, I couldn't say that I was in love with banking and finance but I was in love with parts of it, you know? I was in love with, with developing people, you know? I was in love with problem solving. I was in love with uh, creating something bigger than, uh, that, that, that didn't exist before, you know? I was in love with solving crises, you know? And so even though it wasn't something that I would have probably picked as a little boy to put up on my wall, <laughs> <laughs> what I was able to understand was that anything that you do, there are elements to it that you can actually love and actually grow from and develop. And so I stayed in it for as long as I possibly could. And then just always had a feeling that I just wanted to try to do something on my own. And I thought, you know, I was getting to the age where I thought, if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do it. And so I made the jump August 1st, 2008. Isn't that timing for you? Huh? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Right before like the biggest you, crash. You knew what was coming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the second biggest crash of the, of the century. And uh, so I decided to go into consulting at the time. And actually, I didn't decide to go into consulting at the time. I actually started off, I was going to create a, a financial firm uh, based on options trading. And so I was studying to get my licenses. My wife, or my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, came and said to me, hey, my best friend's husband is about to lose his business. You used to run big companies. You fix this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's an order. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. And so, uh, so I did. And we took a company that was struggling with four employees and we built them up to that were that with the boys were earning no money. There was two owners. And uh, we took them from making nothing and four employees to each of them in six figures within 12 months, and the company grown to 25 employees. What was interesting about that, though, was we had created jobs for 21 employees. The average wage was 23 bucks an hour. Now, in Canada, in the little town we were in, that was a significant wage. You could support a family of four on that, you know? And I thought, huh, isn't that interesting? By helping this company grow, we were able to support moms and dads and kids and help them to, you know, go to school and help them to be fed and closed and get housing. And we were able to create little microcosms of communities by building these businesses, you know, that we would create a support for the larger community as well, because they're going to go out and buy stuff from the local people as well. And I thought, well, geez, that's a pretty good way to to change things, isn't it? Very practical. 
And then what was funny is because I helped that company, then another company said, hey, well, I saw what you did there. Can you help me? And then we fixed that one. And then another guy said, well, can you help us? And then we fixed that one, et cetera. And that's, that's what I've been doing now for, I guess, 14 years. Wow. What a, yeah. uh, an amazing story. And uh, any regrets that you uh, didn't stick all your time in options trading? <laughs> um, no. No. <laughs> you know yeah, what was sad about answer. what was sad about the options trading was is that I often found myself in a dark room in the middle of the day watching a a, 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 a dot go across a screen and I thought, is this how I'm gonna die? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and not to take anything away from people who trade options, because let me tell you, those people who do it are are brilliant and I have a, lots of respect for them. But for me, I just realized. I'm not that kind of a person. I need contact. I need contact with with you, with other people. I just that's that's how I'm wired. Yeah. Yeah. It, it needs to be a values fit, and it it sounds like it sounds like you found your way into that values fit. And of course, yeah. uh, you don't get to be a CEO of a large organization unless you uh, build skills with people and you like being around people and uh, and doing yeah. that. So I'm glad that you found your way there. And it seems like there's a lot of businesses along the way that you've been able to help. Now, you described what you do with Black Diamond Financial is we monetize genius. So why don't yes. you give us a bit of an example? Like, how are you doing that right now? How are you helping to monetize genius? Sure. Um, I, I'm, I'm very lucky in the sense that I, I've been very fortunate to work with incredibly smart, smart people who might be so focused in a particular discipline that they haven't yet had a chance to 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 absorb what it would take to run a successful business in that in that discipline. So what we do at, at BDF Corp is we 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 help them to get the business of their business. Right. So that they can concentrate on, I'll give an example. There was a, there was a company in Switzerland uh, that was in advanced uh, molecular research, okay? All very smart people, you know, PhDs all, all around. And the, pres and the president of the company is also a PhD. So incredibly smart, but have never spent any time developing business skills. So, you know, we come in, we help them because they're already really smart. They usually absorb pretty quickly. And what we do is we're able to help help, help them create a, a framework that works for their specific type of discipline, right? And not all the disciplines are exactly the same or the frameworks are exactly the same because they, they will change based on whether you're in healthcare or research or you know, manufacturing or finance or whatever, right? But there are frameworks for each one, right? And the people who are usually the most successful are the ones who are the ones who are humble enough to say, yeah, we're really good at this, but we don't know about this. And so they invite us in to help and we're very grateful that they do. So. That's wonderful. Now you do that across a range of different industries. Uh, and right. I know we were having a conversation before around this, you have interest in health, you have interest in finance, uh, manufacturing, technology. So, uh, you're a man of many, many talents in many industries, Kevin. But you know, what's interesting is that um, they all have core capabilities, really, like core, core requirements, let's say, okay? And, there's, and even though they're different uh, companies that express themselves in a lot of different ways, just as you know, Kevin, there are certain things, right? You have to have revenue, you know? You have to have control of your expenses. You have to understand your market. You have to understand who you're competing with. You have to, just have to understand, you know, how to manage, uh, you know, things like accounts payable and accounts receivable and the business part of all of that. And so you can set up frameworks that, that are all in one sense, they're all teachable, right? And if you're sensitive enough and, and listen to them, and understand them well, you can set up stuff that works for their particular situation as well, you know? Um, so, you know, one of, the, one of the things, this is why I've always loved you and the work you do, is because you get that, right? You can walk into just about any company, and I've seen you do it. You can walk into just about any company and within, you know, a day or two, understand what their key issues are, right? You can uh, review financials with, with people and within a few moments even, start to understand where to look for the serious problems 
and, and help them to understand what, the, what is obvious to you may not be obvious to them, right? You're a wonderful mirror for companies and you're able to reflect back to them stuff they can't see, right? Which is why I've always admired you. Stop it, Karen, stop. stop. Yes, I know, yeah. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, uh, I'm blushing here, it's very kind of you to, to say such, uh, such very kind things. And I know you recognize uh, that in myself because that's that's how you show up and, and that's what you do. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Kevin, I, I'd love to know a little bit about your thinking. This, this uh, podcast in particular really likes it to delve into mindset. And one of the questions we ask is that the quality of the questions we ask ourselves impact the quality of our life. And with that yep. being true, I wonder what's one question that you've asked that's had the biggest positive impact on your life or the life of the clients that you serve? Three words. Is it true? Ooh, I like this question. Tell me, how is that such an impactful question? <laughs> this is when, you know, this is where the reality meets the perception of reality, right? And part of, if you can get that person to understand that those two things are actually different things, then real learning starts, right? And, and, and real growth starts then too. You know, the, 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 that my perception of reality may or not, may or may not reflect reality, you know? And so particularly when I get into situations with, with senior teams and, or CEOs, when they explain something to me and it's, it sounds so dire, right? And then the one question I ask them is, well, is it true? And they say, well, of course it's true. I wouldn't say it otherwise. I said, <laughs> okay. But let me ask you then, you know, let's get into this now. And then we start breaking things down. Like, is, is all parts of it true? Is there some parts that could have a different reality? Is there other alternative things? What else might be possible, right? And then what they start to realize is that while they had thought that, that it was true, that it, in fact, it was only true in their own mind, right? That in fact, there are lots of other th different things or ways to approach it or alternate actions that they can take, right? And I, I found even for myself, you know, when I get to the top of where I think, you know, I'm, I'm done, I'm, I can't get anymore, you know, I can't do anymore, right? And I think to myself, is that true, right? Is that, mm -hmm. is that as good as you're gonna get? Oh, okay, well, Let's think about that for a minute, right? And then I start to think about maybe listening to some people who might be, have different feelings on that, you know, from different alternative thoughts, you know, and I start looking for people outside of myself that might reflect back on into myself to realize most of the time that it's, it's bull, what I'm telling myself, you know, <laughs> at least when it comes to, at least when it comes to limitations, you know? Yeah, that's such a powerful question. Is it true? And you, I mean, you hit the nail on the head when you spoke about reality or the perception of reality. Because if you change your perception, most things that you've seen can be really true, aren't always true. I had yeah. someone say this to me once, like you're sat in your chair right now, how fast are you going? Like, what's, what's the speed? And it's like, well, I'm going at naught miles an hour, I'm sat in a chair. I'm like, well, hang on a second. Let's go back to your example, Kevin. You know, let's be off of Earth. How fast is the Earth rotating? Yeah. How fast is the Earth flying through space? And all of a sudden, you, you know, your re reality is, hey, no, I'm traveling at zero miles an hour. You're not. You're actually traveling at, I don't know, 18,000 kilometers a second or whatever, whatever yes, it is. Exactly. So no matter how many yeah. different ways we, we can change our perception or our perspective, it can change yep. you know, what, what is true there. Um, so yeah. is it true? I love that. Now, Kevin, that really works right at the core of someone's belief about a situation so by asking that you're kind of really probing or shaking someone's belief about what's what's really happening yeah to be honest with you most of the work that i do is getting to the core of the human being that's in front of me yeah. and really shaking them up so that they have a chance to reorganize themselves in a new pattern and in a pattern that may be unfamiliar but a pattern that they feel is better you know yeah yeah. And, and I know that's what you spend a ton of time doing. And frankly, I learned 
some of my techniques from you under the years that we were together. I take some of my techniques from you. So I have you to thank for that. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, that is true. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, well, the questions Kevin, that you that. asked. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful because those, those questions can make a real big difference. And you, you remind me a little bit of um, Byron Katie, who, who also delves into this work. She asked a very similar question on that, like, is it true? And it's, it's amazing how quickly people's beliefs, long-held beliefs can drop away. And then mm -hmm. you help them find the alternative belief. Like, if that's not absolutely true, then what, what really is? What could be true? Yeah. What, what else is possible? So I love this question. I, I urge anyone listening... You know, if you're feeling limited or stuck in any area of your life, let's examine those beliefs. Is it true? I had a client, Kevin, um, he had this belief around money, like money was hard to come by. And you know, you delve into this question, you go specific on that belief. Is it absolutely, is that absolutely true? And all of a sudden, once you start digging into it and he starts finding different references, well, it's not you know, because I had a big increase on my house, my shares went up, I inherited this yeah. money, all this money came to me easy. All of a sudden he has a different belief that money isn't hard to come by, money is easy to come by. Now, when he yeah. walks around with that belief instead, all of a sudden, guess what? He, he now believes money is easy to come by. He's finding money everywhere, and, and yeah. the revenue goes up. In, you know, yeah. increase goes up. So, your your question, I absolutely love that because it, it does go to the core of a belief or a person. Kevin, that's such a great insight. I'd also love to hear from you to have the level of success you've had uh, in helping other people. You must have some habits and rituals that you like to use on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. What are some of, the, some of the habits and rituals you might be to share with us that we can maybe embody ourselves? Yeah. Um, I spend a lot of time um, during, the, during the week uh, just listening to people smarter than me, you know, uh, people wiser than me. I wouldn't say they're probably smarter, but, but more importantly, they're wiser than me. And one of the things that I, that I, I because I don't read as much as I, have time to listen because I, I can listen and do other things as I try to listen, use my car as the uh, basically the place when I'm traveling from gig to gig. Uh, usually that's my rolling university, you know. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I uh, that I really feel that's important is self-examination. Is to take some time at the end of each week. And to really say what went well, you know. And more importantly, what am I grateful for? And then to spend some time and think about, you know, you know, did, 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 I, did I make a difference in somebody's life this week, you know? And what is the opportunities uh, for me this week? And how do I wanna show up for them in the, in the week following? And I usually do that Sunday evening. I usually do that before I plan my week. So I have an examination of, well, an examination of self. And then that gives me kind of inspiration to what I want to do, how, how I want to orient my week, right? Because I don't want to just do a bunch of stuff, right? The thing that, that, that really, really excites me now is really diving deep into the essence of who these people are and what, what will allow them to release themselves to be the best person for themselves, the best people for their employees, the best people for their families, the best people for their communities, how they can show up and to really get to the core of them, to challenge them, right? And to really ask them to, to allow themselves to be who they really are. And sometimes that's really tough and really painful, but it's always exhilarating when they discover that they're something more than they thought they were, you know? And the work, that. yeah, the work just becomes an excuse to make better people, yep. right? That's all it is. It's beautiful, Kevin. And uh, I, I know that's exactly what you do. I, I've had the privilege of being around you and, and experiencing that. So I, I know exactly what that's like. And so just as a recap, those four questions and the self-examination, what went well? What am I grateful for? Uh, did I make a difference? And oh, did I miss one? And the final one, oh, was it one how yeah, how do I want to show up this week? Yeah. yeah. I love those four questions. And I think these would be great habits to embed as you plan out your week. Well, as mm -hmm. not you, even listeners, <laughs> me, I think these are things that I can add into uh, to my weekly preparation. I think it allows a good, uh, good opportunity of reflection. And Kevin, you also mentioned uh, making your car a university uh, on wheels. I'd love to hear from you. Is there 
one book that uh, that stands out to you? You clearly read a lot and understand a lot. Is there one book that you think, hey, that that one really made the biggest difference to me? Yeah, you're gonna laugh at me though. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm prepared. <laughs> I think it was written in 1927. Um, it's called As a Man Thinketh. I don't know if you've ever read it. Mr. James Allen, is that right? Yeah, yeah, James Allen. You can read it in about 17 minutes. It's yeah. really quick. But I think I've listened to that. I have it on Audible. I think I've listened to that book a million times, you know? Yeah. And what it's interesting is that you listen to it and then you implement it and then you go away from it for a while, then you listen to it again. And every time it changes, it changes, it changes, it changes. And so you hear words differently and phrases differently. And because you're implementing it and you're growing as it's growing and it's growing with you. And then you realize, holy mackerel, we truly are masters of our own fate and captains of our own soul, right? And, and, and that in itself is as scary as it is exhilarating. It's kind of like being in a space capsule looking down at the rest of the earth. Oh, yes. Scary, but <laughs> exhilarating. Uh, and there is a way to bring the whole conversation full circle, Kevin. I, I love that. Very uh, neatly dovetailed there. So as a man think if, uh, I, I, I did read that one many years ago, but uh, it's a good prompt to go back and have a read of it again. You know, you read those things and you get value from it at the time, but you're right. I guess if you, uh, you come back and see them again uh, another time, another perspective, uh, you'll, yes. you'll read it and understand it in a very different way. So I love that. Kevin, uh, as always, it has been a complete pleasure today. If anyone listening uh, feels as though they'd like to reach out to you or connect with you, where would be the best place for them to do that? Probably Kevin at bdfcorp.ca. That's Kevin at b, bravo, d, delta, f, foxtrot, corp, c-o-r-p, dot c-a. And yeah, I'd be happy to chat with anybody who wanted to chat. Yeah. Such a very kind and generous offer. And Kevin, if there is there any, uh, any final messages or words you'd like to share today? Yeah. Yeah. I love you, brother. <laughs> I love you too, Kevin. <laughs> I really do. I love you. Thank you so much for your time and energy. 